Um, so today's lecture will be on fluids and sound. Um, this lecture is a little bit strange in that fluids is a very general topic. So it has a lot of different subtopics that aren't exactly related and sound is also kind of pretty unrelated to fluids. Um, the reason I would wanted to do these lectures all together is because sound is a very small topic and this and fluids is a fairly small topic straightforward. So I just wanted to combine all of these together. Um, but do keep in mind that a lot of these topics are not related and I'll and you, you'll notice that we're going to be skipping a little bit from chemistry to physics and then back a little bit. So um, keep that in mind. And like some of these topics are not to be like really mixed together. Um, so they should really kind of be like separate. Okay. And I'll make sure to let you guys know when we're moving from one topic to another. Um, the reason, especially with fluids, I wanted to do the different fluids topics together is because um, whenever you I will see a question that involves any kind of liquid, gas, or water, I wanted you guys to take back to this lecture and try and find an answer from this lecture. Okay. Um, personal introduction, um, in case this is your first lecture. My name is Mark. Um, I'm a graduate of Stony Brook University um, with a degree in biochemistry. I recently took the MCAT this January and scored a 520. Here's my email if you ever want to contact me personally with any questions. Um, this is a 15 week full course. I believe we're in week six. This is the start of week six. Um, lectures Thursday, Friday, Saturday at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, office hours Sunday at 8.30, okay? Um, we do also have a group me, which uh, we'll be posting in the chat periodically. If you wanna join, um, has all the lecture recording links and PowerPoints posted. Um, it's also, if you have any questions uh, for me or any of the other tutors, or sometimes even um, other students have answers to your questions. Um, it's a great way to get a hold of somebody and get your questions answered without privately emailing. Um, also, we'll be posting any updates or changes to scheduling there or announcements. Okay. So I would highly recommend joining the group me if you can. So learning objectives for today. First, we're going to talk about what are fluids generally, right? Some of us may have an idea, but I, I want to maybe correct some misconceptions you may have. Um, and one of those is um, about gases. So we're gonna learn about what the gas law is and some of the equations and um, quantities that you need for gases. Uh, we're gonna be uh, talking about how flow of fluids changes in different conditions and what factors affect uh, fluid flow. We're also gonna be talking about the buoyancy force and Archimedes principle. Um, we're also, at the end, we're going to be talking about sound waves and how are sound waves presented to us. Okay. Um, as you can see, this is a very um, broad set of topics, right? Not exactly perfectly connected, but like I mentioned, um, these are very smaller, lower yield topics on the MCAT that just wouldn't warrant their own lecture. But when you, but in all together in one lecture, they would fit. Um, that they're also pretty necessary to know for the MCAT and on their own, but they're also necessary to know for future knowledge, right? Fluids can help in cardiovascular, gas exchange is very important for pulmonary um, system, sound waves are just generally important for hearing, okay? So moving on to the content. First, we're going to start off with gases. Um, uh, the first misconception I wanted to um, change was that we think of fluids as liquids, but gases are also fluids. Uh, fluid is anything um, that's essentially not um, not a, a uh, not a solid. So both liquids and gases would count as fluids, right? That means they can also flow like liquids, right? You know that fluids flow um, through any kind of uh, piping or anything like that. Well, gases work the same way. In depth, gas flow is a little bit complicated and it's not really tested on the MCAT. Um, the main thing that we want to talk about um, with gases um, is what properties they have and how gas exchange occurs, especially this is important for respiratory, which we haven't covered yet, but uh, we will eventually. And this is just a little bit of introduction into that. So some basic information about gases. 
So the fundamental properties that you should know about guess and the ones uh, presented in the, are the ones that are presented in the fundamental gas law equation. I'm sure many of you have seen PV equals NRT, uh, P equals pressure, V equals volume, N equals moles, R is the gas constant, um, and T is temperature in Kelvin. This equation is very important to know, to memorize, um, because this is one of the fundamental equations for all gas problems um, to get different um, variable, uh, to get different properties from gases. So for example, if you want to find the volume of a gas, the pressure of a gas, this is how usually you would do it. Um, also, the five quanti uh, the four quantities listed here, pressure, volume, moles, and temperature are some of the most important for gases, right? They're the main ones that you should know for gases um, that make up a gas, right? The other uh, property of a gas that's kind of important is whether it's a monatomic gas or a diatomic gas, which um, kind of relates to um, this. So for example, you know that oxygen in its atomic form is not usually found as just O, it's found as O2, which is diatomic because there's two. And then there's uh, monoatomic gases, which are just um, say like, fluorine, right, which may be found um, alone like this, right, and it would be a monotomic gas, something like that, okay. So um, another important uh, quantity for uh, gas, specifically gas exchange, is partial pressure, and um, if you know for um, possibly either from your previous classes or one of our really old lectures on um, equilibrium, we talked about partial pressures being important for equilibrium. Um, it's also really important, it's really important for equilibrium. And in that sense, it's also really important for movement diffusion across membranes. So partial pressure is usually written as uh, P and with underscript the gas. So for example, P underscript O2 would uh, be the partial pressure of oxygen, right? Or O2. Um, Partial pressure is a measure of how much of the total pressure of the gas mixture, mixture a certain gas makes up. For example, if the total pressure of a gas mixture in a jar is, we found out is 20 pascals, and the partial pressure of CO2 in the mixture we found is 10 pascals, that means um, of the 20 total pascals, CO2 by itself contributes 10 of those pascals, and the other 10 are made up by other gases that may be in the mixture, right? Um, what this also means, oh, sorry. What this also means is that half of the of all moles of gas in the container are moles of CO2, right? Um, so again, this is slightly different. This is where kind of moles versus di um, diatomic comes in. For example, CO2 is actually made up of three atoms, C and two O's, right? But CO2, one mole of CO2 is one whole CO2, right? And for example, if the other gas you had in there was nitrogen, right? Just nitrogen by itself, um, that had 10 Pascal, uh, that was the other 10 Pascals that has a partial pressure. That means half CO2, half nitrogen. That means half of the gas, half the moles of gas are CO2, half of the moles of gas are nitrogen, right? But that doesn't mean the amount of nitrogen and say oxygen is the same, right? Because in, so if we had like say 10 moles of um, nitrogen, 10 moles of CO2, right? That would mean there's 20 total um, oxygen and 10 total nitrogen, but the partial pressures are still the same. So diatomic versus monatomic or anything like that doesn't make a difference in really in partial pressures. Partial pressure is really only focused on moles, right? Mainly on moles. And another way to think about it is actually um, mold, mold fractions, if you guys know what that is, um, which is again, the same thing. It's just the percentage of moles. Uh, for gases, partial pressure compared to total pressure and mole fraction compared to total moles is exactly the same, right? So in, especially for liquids and solids, we use mole fractions which is how many moles of something are what, what, what percent of something is like the moles of the whole thing. Um, whereas in gases, we usually use partial pressure, but you can use uh, mole fraction for gases as well. 
and it's actually the same exact um, ratio or percentage as mole fraction. Does that make sense? Um, so um, the reason we talked about partial pressure is gas exchange. So we'll talk a little bit about that now. Um, gas exchange naturally will follow a partial pressure gradient. So we'll go from a high partial pressure to a low partial pressure, right? This is one of the main reasons that capillaries are able to exchange O2 and CO2 with the lungs. So pulmonary arteries, which if you remember from the cardiovascular system, um, they are actually, unlike the other arteries, they're deoxygenated because they're, co they're um, coming after the heart, after it went around the whole body, then through the heart, it went to the pulmonary system. So they're deoxygenated. That means they have low partial pressure of oxygen because most of the gas that makes up um, that blood is uh, CO2. It's, there's very little, very little percent is actually O2. Most of the percent is CO2. So that means they have a low partial pressure of oxygen, but a high partial pressure of CO2 in them. And whereas in the lungs, um, the o partial pressure of oxygen is very high. And so partial pressure gradient goes from high partial pressure in the lungs of O2 to low in the capillaries. So it goes from the lungs to the capillaries, but there's high partial pressure of CO2 in the capillaries and low in the lungs. So it goes from capillaries to lungs. Okay, and that's exactly what you would expect, right? When you need to get air from the lungs, you take air from the lungs into the blood, and then you send CO2 as waste out and back into the lungs so it can be exhaled out, okay? Any questions on anything related to gases before I move on? So I know I talked a lot about, about a lot, Oh, uh, somebody, men oops, sorry. Uh, somebody mentioned um, the wrong R. Um, so there's um, there's actually multiple R's, right? This may not be the one that you're used to seeing. Um, it really, it depends on like the, the R has different values depending on which units you're using. So for Thank example, um, if you notice, I'm using joules per mole per Kelvin. This is probably the most common form you'll see, but there's other forms with different uh, values. I believe there's the other one is 8.2 or something like that. And it relates to atmospheres, which is um, in this situation actually is likely what you'll use, but um, this is just an example. Um, the R constant that they want you to use, they'll always give you. They don't really require that you memorize it. So they'll give you, this was just one example um, because this is like the most common R value. Maybe not exactly for this equation, but um, Sometimes you can actually relate pressure and volume to work. So sometimes you would actually use this as R as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So th this may, um, yeah. The, the, it, R is just know that R is different depending on what um, variables you're looking for and which variables or which units you're looking for and which units um, match up, right? Um, as for what questions they may ask about this, um, I would say the, the most, um, the other R is I don't, I don't recall the exact value um, for it. And like I mentioned, if they ever ask you about it, they'll always give it to you in along with the units. Um, they, they don't ask you to really memorize constants. Um, so you, you shouldn't worry about that. If anything, you can always, um, if you look up R constant um, for gas law, oops. Um, the gas law R constant, um, they'll, they'll give you all three values and which units are associated with it. So this is one of them. They'll give you the other one, I believe it's 8.216 and that it relates to atmosphere, but I don't remember it exactly, sorry. But yeah, you, you don't have to memorize it either, but if, if for your own curiosity, you wanna look it up now, you can look it up on Google. Um, some questions they may ask you about this um, involving the gas constant. They may ask you to find um, some kind of variable, PV equals NRT. Like mentioned, um, Janelle mentioned, some questions may be more conceptual uh, based. Um, 
regarding either partial pressure, um, which way it's diffusing. Mainly um, the question they'll ask you with gases, I would say is actually related to pulmonary system um, and gas exchange. So using this partial pressures um, system and the partial pressure in the gas exchange um, regarding the pulmonary system. We're not gonna be covering the pulmonary system um, today because um, that's a separate lecture because there's a lot of content to cover with it. Um, but um, this, I just wanted to cover this today because it would be a little bit too much to cover with the pulmonary system on a different lecture. I wanted to give an introduction, and especially because gas is a fluid and can flow like a fluid. I just wanted to cover it today. Um, okay, last question before I move on. Is the pulmonary bringing back oxygenated or deoxygenated blood? Um, so pulmonary artery, again, remember artery away, artery is going away from the heart. Pulmonary artery has deoxygenated blood. Pulmonary vein has oxygenated blood. And essentially that that's, um, the artery is going away from the heart with deoxygenated blood because it, it has already used up all its oxygen to, uh, sense the rest of the body first, right? Because it's like the last stop, like the refueling station, if you want to think of it that way for oxygen in the blood. And then one, and the vein, which is going back to the heart for the next round of um, cycle, for the next like cycle, that's oxygenated, right? But the artery is deoxygenated, going away from the heart. The vein going back is deoxygenated, uh, is oxygenated, sorry. Okay. Um, so next we're gonna take a little bit of a detour to uh, physics and forces. Right, with the buoyancy and Archimedes principle, okay? So this is a more of a straightforward concept. So gas exchange is really focused on um, kind of like pulmonary stuff. And it'll, it's something that I want you to know because it'll come back later. Buoyancy is more straightforward. And actually um, you may have learned something very similar earlier okay, when we covered our physics lecture on forces. Um, uh, buoyancy is a force. Right, it's just a force exerted by water or any liquid, really, and even um, air. Right. So going back to our physics lecture on forces, we know that gravity always acts downward on every object. But no, the reason we don't just fall down infinitely is because the, it's normally canceled out by the normal force, which is exerted by a floor or a table or any surface that the object rests on. Water, however, doesn't have a normal force as it's not a solid, yet objects don't just straight sink to the bottom. They still float in water, um, some objects at least. This is because water has another upward force called the buoyant force, right? And I can, and it's shown here, right? Gravity, WB is going down, uh, which is equal to mg of the object. And then uh, balancing it out, going upwards is FB, which is the buoyant force, right? Exerted by the liquid. Like water. So the buoyant force follows the same rules as all the other forces we talked about earlier. Mainly, it's a vector, has a direction, and has magnitude. The direction it has is always up towards the surface of the liquid, or in the MCAT, all, all situations you'll see is upward towards the surface of the water or the liquid. And it has a magnitude shown by the equation FB equals rho GV. It may look like a P, but that is actually the Greek letter rho and rho stands for density. So in this situation, because we're talking about the buoyant force, we really only care about the liquid. We, do, we don't really care about the object, at least initially, right? So rho is the density of the liquid, not the object. Remember that because sometimes they may give you the density of the object, which you'll need for something else to solve in this equation, but not, it's not the density, it's not the rho. Um, for water, the density is about 1,000 kilograms per meter squared. Um, they'll give it to you if you don't remember it, but it's very simple to remember. Say have, have another liquid, say and just anything else, maybe like blood or any other kind of liquid they may have, they'll give you the density. Um, G, you know, is the acceleration due to gravity. It's 9.8 meters per second squared. And V is the volume, again, of the liquid displaced in meters cubed. Uh, right, so again, the volume of the water that gets moved or displaced. And um, 
uh, I hope you guys remember that if you put an object, if you have uh, water and you put an object in the water, the water level rises. That's what we mean by displaced, right? It, it changes, right? And the water level rises because the object is taking up space or it's taking up volume actually, okay? Also remember that rho equals mass divided by volume for any object. Um, this is what I mentioned when I said they may give you the density of an op of the object that's submerged in water. Rather than using it directly in this buoyancy force equation, you would actually, um, this is what you would likely use it for, rho equals mass times volume to find uh, something else, okay? But because volume displaced is fairly hard to measure by itself, we want an easier way to do it. So like I mentioned, we only care really initially about the liquid. So rho is density of the liquid. V is the volume of the liquid that's displaced. We're only talking about liquid. But volume displaced of the liquid is a little bit hard to measure. There's this thing called Archimedes principle, which actually finds us an easier way to do it. So Archimedes principle states that the volume displaced of the liquid is always equal to the volume placed in the liquid, right? So if you place an object of a certain volume in a liquid, the volume displaced of the water will always be equal to the volume of the object that you placed inside of the water, right? What this essentially means for us, for our equation, is that the V in the buoyancy force equation can be replaced with something called Vs, which is the volume of the object that is submerged in the liquid. So here I said, this is only regarding the liquids, the volume of the liquid displaced, but we can actually substitute it, this V, with the volume of the object, as long as the object is submerged, which means underwater or under liquid, right? Okay. So an example of this would be if you had a wooden cube, right? Um, it was if it was completely submerged in water and had and the cube you knew had a volume of 10 meters cubed, the volume in the FB equation, which is the, the amount of water displaced when you put the cube in, would also be 10, since the volume of liquid displaced is equal to the volume submerged, right? So while I said initially we're looking at the, the only the liquid, you actually can, using Archimedes principle, substitute in the volume of the object, right? And um, this is what I mentioned. This is why they may give you the density of the object. And this is why I gave you this equation, density equals mass over volume, because they may ask you to find, in order to solve this, you have to find the volume of the object, which is this V. If they give you the density and they give you the mass of the object, you could find the volume of the object and the, vo and the density of the object would actually be used to find it this V, not substituted here. Please remember that. Okay. Um, another thing I wanted to mention, if the cube instead, again, like I mentioned, the volume displaced is equal to the, the volume submerged underwater. Sometimes, as we know, especially for wooden cubes, um, the submerged, not usually not the whole cube will be underwater. Part of it will be underwater, part of it will be floating on the surface of the water. We're only looking at the part that's underwater, not the part that's above water. So if the cube is only half submerged in water, which they, they would mention in the question, if it's half submerged, that means half the cube is above water, half of the cube is submerged. The volume of water displaced would only be half of the volume of the cube or five meters cubed. This is because only five cubic meters of the cube are actually underwater. The other five cubic meters are above water, right? There's and so they're not displacing water, right? And yes, th this is an example of Archimedes principle. And then we could use this Archimedes principle to then substitute in and find the buoyant force, right? We could find we could substitute it into this main equation for buoyancy force, right? For this v. This is how we find this v. Because G, we already know what G is. G is 9.8, or you can round it off to 10. We already know what this is every single time, right? Density of the liquid, it's water, it's 1,000, it's this. If, um, or otherwise they'll give it to you or they may ask for it, right? If it's not water. Uh, but V is what we usually have to find. 
Okay. Um, any other question then before we move on to a poll question? Okay, I'm gonna start the poll. Please take your time. So this is a little bit more of a, I would guess a little bit of a conceptual question with a little bit of using, actually using the equation as well. So please take a look, try your best. Please take another minute or so, another 30 seconds a minute to answer this question. Okay, I'm gonna close the polling in about a second. Okay. So the vast majority of people picked D, right? 79%, however, the correct answer is actually um, A, right? And this involves some, a little bit of what we talked about before the forces. So first thing you have to notice, is this is a force problem. First step in any force problem, draw a diagram. So you had a box, gravity always pointing down, points force pointing up in water, sorry. And it said it's suspended, right? So it would be like this, underwater, buoyancy force uh, pointing up, gravity pointing down. Um, next, it mentioned it's stationary, right? It's stationary, that means F net, the net force is zero, because if it's stationary, that means acceleration is zero. Using F equals MA, um, F, F net has to be zero as well. Um, so F net is zero. Um, and so uh, we know that MG, that means the downward force of gravity and the upward buoyant force are exactly equal. So MG equals um, the buoyancy force, which is equal to rho uh, G and then V, right? So what they're saying is we'll apply a momentary downward force, right? So we'll like maybe push it a little bit and then we'll stop, right? And what will happen, right? Well, if the object has the same density as water, right? And I mentioned volume, we're talking about the volume of water. So density of the object, I'll call it rel O of the object, is equal to mass over volume, right? So volume is equal to um, mass over rho. Um, this and this cancel out, right? So all you're left with is essentially mg equals mg. So the forces are, this is like how you prove that the forces are equal. 
right? You don't actually even need to do all that, right? Um, if you know that in order to return to its initial position, the buoyancy force has to actually push it up, right? It has to be, it has to become stronger than the gravitational force. But look, mg equals mg, it won't ever change, right? Because the mass won't change of the, of the object and gravity won't change. So the buoyancy force will never change. Doesn't matter how deep you push it in, really the, the buoyancy force won't really change in, in this situation, right? Um, so if you have an extra downward force, they're in perfect equilibrium right here, and you apply a slight downward force, that causes it to go downward because a force always means there will be an acceleration, right? You apply force, it starts accelerating for a little bit, um, and then eventually it'll continue to sink downwards because there's no upward force that's kind of correcting it, if that makes sense, right? It will stop accelerating because um, it'll stop accelerating so it will go at a constant velocity because there will be no force afterwards exerted on it because um, if you give it a slight force, then eventually you stop giving it the force. So the force again will cancel. So the F net will again be zero, meaning the acceleration will again be zero. Um, but it will still continue moving downwards because it was set on that path. An object in motion will not stop until acted upon by another force. We know that there's no fluid friction, so it won't stop unless there's another force, right? And there's no upward force that's getting stronger. The only reason it might stop is if the buoyancy force somehow got stronger and ended up pushing it up. But we know that that won't happen. Um, somebody asked, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, force buoyancy is uh, rho GV, right? It's this part, rho GV. Uh, this is equal to gravity. Mg is equal to gravity. Um, the reason we know that is because we know F net is equal to zero for this particular problem. That means the sum of all the forces. So gravity is going down and FB is going up. Because FB going up and MG going down are the same, just in opposite directions, we can say FB and MG are equal. So we set MG on the left and FB on the right. And then I just expanded out FB into rho GB. Yeah, so in this case, they're, they're the same because not, nothing's moving. Um, the reason I mg because uh, mg equals mg is because, um, again, break down what is um, the volume of this object. You know that um, the density of the object is equal to the mass of the object divided by the volume of the object, right? right? And if you separate volume, you actually end up getting v, volume of the object, is equal to uh, mass of the object over the density of the object. So you can substitute this V with this M over rho, right? So it's rho G M over rho. Because they mentioned um, an object with the same density as water, so rho of the object and rho of the water are the same. Rho G, rho times G divided by rho, you can just get rid of rho, right? Because like terms on the top and the bottom. You just have G times M. You're just left with that. Yeah. Yeah, you set them equal essentially because the densities are the same. Um, so the reason that the object continues to sink after the downward force is removed is because of Newton's, I believe, first law. An object in motion will all will continue to be in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. The object is set in motion by the slight force of your touch set in motion, right? But there's no friction. There's not, no alternative force that's going upwards to actually counteract it, right? So unless you apply some kind of force, the object will never stop moving, right? Unless that, that's what uh, Newton's first law is. An object in motion will stay in motion, right? An object is in motion because of the slight touch and there's no force acting upon it because it said there's ignore the effects of fluid friction. There's no upward force. And so it will continue to stay in motion. Um, what would happen if the density of the of the object and water were different? 
if the density of the object and the water were different, um, the object would either float up or it would sink down. The reason for that is because um, it would not it would not be equal, right? Because mg is equal to mg. But and the reason we were able to get mg is because rho e on top is equal to rho on bottom. But if you had say rho um, of water over rho of the object, rho o, right? This is actually the equation: mg equals mg times this ratio, rho of the water density of the water over density of the object. Because they're equal, this is just one, and we can just be left with this. Otherwise, it would not be like that. It would just be different, right? And then obviously you can't have mg equals mg. So like it, the it wouldn't be constant velocity if it wasn't um, the same density. The same density essentially meant that they, they would cancel out. It would perfectly stay submerged in water, like underwater without moving. If it was uh, different, the density was different, it would either sink or it would float. Um, the object uh, it is underwater because uh, it mentioned an object is stationary and suspended in a container filled with water, right? It it's not it didn't say that it was um, it didn't say that it was a float. So it like had a container filled with water, right? And we also know and again we derived it exactly why it was suspended because the buoyancy force going up and the gravity going down were equal. Um, not, no, uh, suspended usually, um, usually they would, they would say a float rather than suspended. Yeah. They would usually mention it's a float. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, again, if and again, if you if you are confused a little bit about the wording, regardless, we can actually essentially like experiment like using the equations find out why it's that it is um, in fact perfectly in equilibrium underwater because mg equals mg. So we could, we could have found it like that way. Um, and again, I mentioned. So let me go over. Let me just go last time quickly over all the answer choices. You mentioned A is correct, right? Because it. It will sink because you applied a force. It won't stop moving down because um, the reason it won't sink before it returns to its initial position. An object in motion will continue to stay in motion, Newton's first law, right? This can't be right. The object will quickly stop sinking. Again, there's no force upwards acting to stop it, essentially. The object's uh, downward velocity will increase over time, so it'll begin accelerating downward. That would only be true, B would only be true, if you continue to apply that force, but because um, you only applied it for a second and then stopped, um, M, all the only forces left were again, mg and buoyancy force. We know that those cancel out perfectly, right? So that means there's no net force because there's no net force, no net acceleration. Acceleration is zero. The object either has to be at rest or moving at constant velocity. So yeah, it can't be B either, right? So this is the only answer that would make sense. Um, no, so it's initially stationary, but at the end, after you apply the slight force, it's no longer stationary. At that point, it's, it's moving, but at constant velocity, stationary and constant velocity mean very different things. Stationary means velocity is zero. Constant velocity means that you have a velocity, but it's just not, um, it's not changing. So you, you couldn't have found it that way. That, that would, that would be wrong. Yeah. And um, as a note, in real life, um, likely C would happen. In real life, likely C would happen because there is fluid friction that would, that would force it to stop sinking, right? Uh, possibly actually even um, D, but I think likely C would happen because there's fluid friction, but they told you to ignore it. Just like um, they may ask you in a physics question, if you rolled a ball along a table, assuming that the table was frictionless, the ball would never stop rolling. But if you, but there's no such thing as a frictionless table. In real life, if you roll the ball, eventually it'll stop moving. If you, even if you moved it on ice, which has very low friction, eventually it'll still stop moving. 
right? So you can't always use real life to solve these problems. You have to actually know the physics. Um, okay, so moving on to our next topic, which is fluid flow, right? Especially with uh, rate of flow. Um, um, this topic is actually pretty related to uh, cardiovascular system, which we, we covered um, believe last week, right? And some of this you may remember, right? And we're just gonna talk about the different variables that could affect flow rate, how fast something flows, okay? Um, again, you may remember there's direct connect connection between the pressure and the flow rate. There's also a connection between actually height and flow rate. If you uh, have, say, um, a pipe, right? You have a pipe that starts over here, then the pipe that's filled with water, with flowing water, then you go straight and then the, the, the pipe goes downward, then it goes to the right. You have two different sections of pipe. The flow here and the flow here will be different, right? They won't be flowing at the same rate usually, right? Because height plays a role in flow rate as well. Um, and you can actually see this based on this equation, which is extremely important. Um, whenever you see a something with involving flow rate, you should probably think of this one or the next one, which I'm about to show. Um, it's called Bernoulli's principle or Bernoulli's equation, uh, where P1 is equal to the static pressure, of, where P is the static pressure of fluid. And um, if you want to think about it, it actually might, maybe might help to think of it. Bernoulli's principle is a very, very, very closely related to conservation of energy, right? And you'll see why I say that, right? So it's looking at two different moments, right? One, like P1, V1, H1, the, this refers to moment one. This is the information at moment one. This is the information at moment two, right? So we're talking at two different moments, right? And we're comparing two different moments in, in time, right? Um, so P1 is the pressure of the fluid, the static pressure of the fluid, then one half rho v, uh, rho v squared, right? Uh, rho again, I mentioned is the density of the fluid. Uh, v, V1 is the velocity of the fluid at moment one squared plus rho GH. Rho again, density, G is 9.8, acceleration due to gravity, and H is the elevation of the fluid. If you notice, this actually looks really, really familiar. This looks almost exactly like uh, the conservation of energy. And this is why I mentioned that conservation of energy is say something like the internal energy plus one half MV squared plus MGH. Those are the three main forms of energy, right? Of uh, kinetic energy, which is one half MV squared and potential energy, which is uh, P PMH, right? Uh, I mean, MGH, sorry, MGH, right? Here, it's very, very similar that one half rho V squared rho GH. The only difference is instead of mass for a liquid, we're, instead of mass, we're using rho density, right? And instead of um, any kind of internal energy, we're using uh, P, which is pressure. And just like with conservation of energy, it e and looking at the second moment, it's equal to the pressure, one half uh, rho, G squared, rho V squared, plus rho GH at the second moment, right? Essentially, this is almost exactly the same as conservation of energy, except just for fluids and fluid flow. What would happen, and now I wanna ask you guys this in the chat, and I want you guys to just answer in the chat, it's not a poll question. What would happen if you kept the pressure the same and everything else the same? So obviously density is, of water doesn't change no matter what you do, density of water doesn't change. What would happen if you increase the velocity, right? And what would happen to the height if you increase velocity and then didn't touch the pressure? If you kept the pressure constant, what would happen to the height? What would ha have to happen to the height? Or, yeah. Or you can think of it vice versa. If you, and actually I think it might help. So think, if you increase the height, if you went from uh, a low position to a high position, right? If the pipe went upwards. What would happen to the velocity from moment one to moment two? So if this is low and this is high, what would happen to the velocity? Which one will be low, which one will be high? So yeah, um, yeah, so exactly. Velocity are inverse, right? So for example, if you, if you increase the height, the velocity decreases low, 
and this becomes high. Exactly. Good job. Perfect. Right? So this is kind of like the impact that um, something like this could have, right? If you manage to keep the pressure constant. If you can't keep the pressure constant, um, you would actually have pressure shifting as well. Okay? Uh, somebody raise your hand, yeah, please. Uh, do you have a question? Mark, can you yeah. hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes, uh, when you related it to the principle of conservation of energy, I get it, the the K, the one half mv squared, which is Kp, and the mgh, which is Pe, potential energy. Now the internal energy, the uh, I've seen it where it's U, and there's a P, is there a PV component to internal energy? Like this P, what, what if I had substitute instead of, you know how kinetic energy is one half mm -hmm. mv squared and mm -hmm. what could I have substituted for the P? Would that be like a U, is that a PV kind of energy or just? Right, what? so so um, so internal energy is related to work. Um, it is also related, so it's related to work. It's also related to PV, yes. I'm not exactly sure how Bernoulli's principle was derived, right? It, it could be uh, related somehow to that because they are related terms. Um, and, and again, density and mass are related, obviously. Uh, but it, it, it's a little bit, it's, it's definitely beyond the scope of the MCAT. And it, I'm not exactly sure, and I don't want to give a wrong answer. Yeah, yeah right? that's so fine. I'm just wondering that they wouldn't try to have a substitute some no. internal energy. Uh, you no, 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 nothing like that. Because, call it th because doing that is also- One half mv squared and- Doing that is also it, it. You can't do that, but you can switch like that between uh, uh, solids and liquids. It, it doesn't work like that. So you, you can't actually. So can't they really won't do that. Do yeah. that. They yeah, just tell us it's internal. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. Moving on. So next up is the continuity equation, right? And if you took a physics class, and I remember my physics professor at um, Stanford when I was learning this for the first time a couple of years ago, um, he mentioned if Bernoulli's equation is something like Batman, continuity equation is, is his Robin, right? They always, they're very related to each other and they always go together when you're answering some kind of uh, fluid related question. They're very usually partnered up together. The way that they're partnered up usually is they'll give you an area, so rho, it doesn't matter, right? In, in the continuity equation, this is the full equation. But look, if rho, again, water doesn't change density. So rho AV, rho AV, you can just cancel out the rho, right? Because they're the same on both sides. It doesn't matter. Essentially, it's just AV1, A1, V1, A2, V2. Usually, what they'll do is they'll give you the um, cross-sectional area, and they'll have you find V1 and V2. And then once you find V1 and V2, you can substitute V1 and V2 into these, right? And then you could um, solve for whatever they're asking for, either pressure or height or something like that, right? And that's what he means by Batman and Robin. They usually work together because most questions involving this will actually be two parts, two steps. They're very related. They're like very, well, I, yeah, the, the, equate, the properties are very related. You use one to find the other. How would changing cross-sectional area, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a second, how would changing A affect, say, the height? How would changing A affect the pressure? How would doing this affect that, right? These two equations are very closely related, and they'll very often, you'll use these two together to solve any kind of uh, problem, okay? Um, I see you have your hand up, uh, just one second. I'll just cover this, and then I'll answer. Um, so like I mentioned, V is uh, velocity. Rho is density, but again, density can be, you can essentially cancel it out. Um, but A is now cross-sectional area of the container. So uh, let me just quickly explain what that is. So for example, if you had a pipe, so imagine this was a pipe, right? The cross-sectional area is um, this area right here, this, this uh, dotted part. So if you were looking, so if the container, the pipe is like this, if you went and looked at it like this, like um, uh, on like the face. So this circle, and then it extends like backwards, right? The cross-sectional area is this shaded region of a pipe, or uh, it could be a pipe, it could be a vessel, like an artery, 
um, or a vein or something like that, right? It could be if we're talking about um, cardiovascular system or if we're talking more about in the physics sense because this type of question could appear either in the biology section where it asks you for um, something with cardiovascular. It could appear in the physics section where it asks you just about like a pipe or some kind of um, tank or something like that, right? This is how you would do it, right? And that's what cross-sectional area means. It means this like circular area and cross-sectional area is always a circle or almost always a circle, right? Um, again, smaller uh, cross-sectional area means a narrower pipe vessel and thus you need a higher velocity in order to maintain the equation. Again, as you guys mentioned for um, in the previous equation, if going from a uh, going from a high to low area, right? Obviously, the velocity would increase in order to maintain the equilibrium, right? If you decrease the area, you have to increase the velocity in order to keep the equation or um, the equation true, since rho is the same on both sides, right? Um, any questions on this before we move on to our next poll question? I'm sorry, I, I am trying to speak through this because again, this is a little bit of a big um, lecture because it has a lot of different topics on it, but we're, we're making good time. Okay. All right, so with no other questions, I'll start the poll. There you guys go. And remember, um, Bernoulli equation and continuity equation are very closely related. Um, most of the time, uh, you'll be uh, asked to use both solving equations. So try it out. Please take another um, 30 seconds to a minute and then I'll uh, close the polling. Okay, and then the polling. So the most popular answer was actually C. Um, however, it was fairly close. The correct answer is actually A and all four answer choices were uh, relatively even. Um, so let me go over this step by step and then um, hopefully we can see um, why that is. Okay, according to your understanding of Bernoulli and the continuity equation, which is the following statements actually describes the phenomenon of vascular flutter, which occurs when an artery becomes constricted due to accumulated plaque, right? So what will the artery look like? An artery is essentially just a pipe. So it looks something like this. 
but then there's this area where it's constricted. So it would look like this and then like that. Here, let me draw the other side as well. Okay. So this is what uh, approximately what it would look like, obviously not exactly, but, um, and fluid is flowing this way, right? When you reach this area, which is the blockage, let's think what would happen? Well, we know that area decreases and we know that as area decreases due to the continuity equation, velocity at that point would have to increase and um, somebody mentioned the, the Venturi effect is actually exactly this, right? Um, as the cross-sectional area here before the blockage is high, uh, the velocity is low. Then during this area, the, the size of the, uh, the, si the cross-sectional area is lower. And so the speed is much higher. And then um, at this point, again, it widens again and the cross-sectional area goes back to being its original speed. And the speed goes back to its original speed if the cross-sectional area goes back to its original speed. This is called um, also the Venturi effect, but you don't really have to know that. Just if you know the principle, it doesn't matter, but yeah. Um, so we know that uh, cross-sectional area in this area goes down, velocity goes up. Well, now let's look at, I'm gonna actually clear this. I'm gonna clear my drawing. Hopefully you guys um, have it kind of like numbered. As A goes down, B goes up. And now let's look at the equation, the Bernoulli equation. I'm just writing it down really quick. Um, so I'm not gonna draw it on the other side, but um, you, you get the idea, it's the same on the other side. Um, we know that rho is constant. We can get rid of rho, we can get rid of one half because that doesn't change from side to side. Both sides have one half. Both sides have rho here, rho here, rho doesn't change. G doesn't change, G is a constant. Um, height, they didn't mention that height was changing. So um, height is the same. The only variables left that are changing are velocity from, from the left side to the right side. So imagine all of this was also copy and pasted to the right side. Um, the only thing that changes from left to right is, or from before to after is the velocity and the pressure. Velocity went up. If the velocity here is lower than it is here on the right side, on the after side, right? The velocity before is lower than the velocity after. Well, that means the pressure before has to be higher than the pressure after in order to balance out and keep the equation true, right? So if P2, P1, 2 squared, right? So you'll get. Um, you, you have to, again, they're inversely proportional. So pressure, because velocity went, because velocity went up and all of the other variables stayed the same except for pressure, pressure is the only variable that uh, it can change. Pressure has to go down, right? So that means the constriction causes a pressure drop. Let's look at the answer choices. So A, the constriction caused the pressure drop, yes. Contract cause the pressure build right before the narrowing. Not exactly, not necessarily true, right? Uh, the pressure uh, well, right at the narrowing, that's obviously not true. Before the narrowing, before the narrowing, um, nothing would really change based on, just based on the continuity equation, the Bernoulli principle, nothing would change right before, nothing would change right after the narrowing. So immediately you could eliminate C and D because According just to the uh, Bernoulli equation and um, and Bernoulli equation and continuity equation, they're only looking at really cross-sectional area and its effect. If the cross-sectional area right before and right after the same, it, it doesn't matter. The pressure and everything else like that will not change. Uh, whereas, um, so we're not looking at things like backup. We're not looking at things like um, Blood will, uh, blood will travel faster, but uh, that actually is wrong because if blood is traveling faster and the velocity is increased, the pressure would have to decrease, but that's not what this is saying. And as you get um, right after the narrowing, the velocity will just go back right, right back to normal after the, the constriction, right? Because at that area, so if we draw it again, like this, if we change the moment to look like 
this moment and this moment rather than um, one of the moments here. Area is the same, that means velocity is the same. The area here and the area here are the same. Continuity equation states velocity here and velocity here will be the same as well. Okay. Um, okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Let me check the chat. Okay, so the more um, so the more narrow, the faster the fluid, the less pressure on the walls. Exactly. Um, more narrow means faster, means velocity increases, velocity increases, assuming height is the same. Height could change, right? The here they, they didn't mention, right? Because they said it, it's on a on a path. But if if you were looking at say um, different parts of your body, like different uh, veins in different parts of your body where there's height differences, or if you're looking uh, if you're talking about like a physical pipe uh, with water. Um, pipes that are higher up and pipes that are lower up, it will be different, right? It's not, it's not exactly, but uh, yes, if height's the same, yes. If, no, if all the other variables are the same. Um, can we relate this to uh, atherosclerosis? Why doesn't the pressure increase? Um, I'm not exactly, I don't really know exactly what atherosclerosis is. Um, so I would need more information about that. Uh, why do they have rho in the constant equations? We are looking at cross-section there. Um, it's just really um, not exactly sure. I think it's just for it to be more complete just because of the way they derived it. Um, I'm not sure. I would have to look into that. But I remember in um, when I was learning about it in uh, physics one as well, um, the professor just said, ignore it. Pretend that uh, the constant equation is just A1 V1 equals A2 V2. But I just wanted it to be more complete. So that's why I included it. Uh, when given a problem like this, we just first look at the effect it has on the country. Um, in this specific case, yes. Other cases, you may actually look at the opposite way. First, how it affects Bernoulli. So for example, if they give you height and they ask you to find the velocity. So for example, if they give you the pressure, uh, here, I'll um, annotate. Uh, hopefully this is uh, enough. I'm gonna it. Um, but if they give you, actually, uh, do that. if they give you the pressure, and the height, and then they ask you to find the velocity and how the velocity would affect cross-sectional area. Well, first you would have to use Bernoulli equation to find the velocity, and then using the velocity you found in the Bernoulli equation, then you would use, then you'd find how it would affect cross-sectional area, right? So it, it depends what, they, what information they give you. Um, oh, okay, so um, I meant building a plaque in the vessels. Um, so there are other reasons that, um, you're, if you mean blood pressure, right, um, there, there, there are different reasons. This is a very micro, um, type of question, right? This is a very, um, very, very, like, looking at a very small piece of the puzzle compared to, like, the whole body system and the whole, like, cardiovascular system, um, and how it gets affected, right? Um, so it, it is safe, pretty safe to make some, you know, the row is the same because I mean, it, just because you went past some, I, I guess technically, especially with blood, maybe, um, but very, very typically, um, unless they say so blood will have the same density before and after, especially since you're only talking about like right before and right after a plaque, right? And that's usually a very small stretch of, um, location. So row is very easy to, um, keep it the same, right? It's very reasonable. Um, same H, again, it's a very small, short piece of a uh, vessel. So you would assume, yes, H would be the same, um, especially because they didn't mention height difference. So you can't really um, assume otherwise, right? There's no, if they don't, if they don't mention it and you can't, and you don't assume it, then you just can't solve the problem. Um, and you know, G is constant, right? So yeah, it, it's usually safe to make uh, assumptions as long as they're, as long as you're confident in those in those assumptions, right? If you make a wrong assumption, it's wrong. But and then in this case, it's not. Oh uh, no, that that I think that has to do more with um, I think that has to do more with um, pooling, like um, the way the blood pools. 
right? So that, that more has to do with like the pooling. If you lay down and it, it like stays like that, and then when you get up, it'll come kind of rush down. Okay, um, well, if there are no other questions, we'll move on to our final topic of the day, which is sound. And this isn't too crazy and it's pretty related to what we covered before with light and optics because sound is the wave. Okay, let's move on. So as a, in a general sense, uh, just like light, sound is a wave and has very much the same properties as any wave, as, as, a, as a light wave, as a sine wave, cosine wave, right? Has an amplitude. It has a wavelength from here to here. It has, uh, or here to here as well, has a frequency f, which is how many, um, how many wavelengths per second, right? Or per, per period, per, per time period. Um, these two don't know rarefaction and compression. Um, compression is uh, this, it's, it refers to this diagram, right? The, this uh, blotted diagram. Um, compression is like, is specifically this where this line is in the middle. Uh, rarefaction is this where there's no line in the middle. But you really don't have to know that. Okay. And then there's also um, velocity of um, propagation, right? Velocity, speed of a sound wave. Um, speed of sound wave is usually in air 300 meters per second, right? Um, v right here. But, yeah, they'll, they'll give you if it's anything else and they'll usually give you even if it is 300, just to be clear. Um, so some general properties, um, again, remember that wavelength equals V over uh, frequency um, fr from when we covered light waves. Speed of sound and air is usually given as 300 meters per second. If it's different, they'll give it to you. Um, even if it is this, they'll probably give it to you anyway. So you don't have to memorize it. In a sound wave, amplitude usually determines uh, loudness. So, um, Remember in um, in light waves, frequency determined what color the light was, or if it was beyond the color spectrum, what type of um, light wave it is in the EM spectrum. Um, in, in a sound wave, amplitude determines loudness. So large amplitude, very loud sound, low amplitude, uh, quiet sound. Whereas wave uh, frequency of wavelength determine pitch, right? High pitch, low pitch is high frequency, low frequency, right? And sometimes things get so high frequency, again, you can't hear them. It's beyond our, um, it's same, similar to visible light spectrum. It gets beyond our audible hearing spectrum, I guess. Um, another thing which we didn't really cover in light, but um, is important here is uh, in phase and out of phase, deconstructive and constructive interference. If two waves are perfectly in phase, they will be constructive. If, they're, if two waves are perfectly out of phase, they'll be perfectly destructive. Here's what this means, right? And sorry, let me annotate. And um, okay. sorry, let me just get, I'm trying to, okay, here, works. Um, so constructive, if you can see, when you add two waves together, you can either get a bigger wave or you can get no wave at all. And these are the two extremes, right? Some things can be somewhat constructive, somewhat destructive. They can be, it, it's a spectrum, right? This, these are just the two extremes of the spectrum. Perfectly constructive, perfectly destructive. Um, and let, let's look what that is. So you notice how there's these peaks and then these troughs, right? And when in these two waves, the peaks and the peaks of the two waves uh, coincide, right? And the troughs and the troughs coincide. So when you add these together, you get two, two peaks at the same point, you can just get a really bigger peak, right? It's kind of like when we talked about um, the uh, action potentials, right? Um, even in uh, actually in muscles, um, when you have multiple action potentials like uh, going together, um, it creates a bigger muscle contraction, but similar to that constructive interference, multiple waves with uh, peaks at the same place will create constructive interference, so it's just a bigger peak or a bigger trough in, in this case here, the bottom. And then again, it will be like that. Whereas in D, a perfectly destructive interference, you notice it's the opposite. This has a peak here and a trough here in the same spot, right? Same spot, there's a peak here and in this wave and a trough here in this wave. Um, assuming that the peak and the trough are the same amplitude, these two waves have the same amplitude, uh, they'll perfectly cancel out 
just like with forces, um, if you have a, a force going up and a force going down, as long as they're the same magnitude, the forces will perfectly cancel and you'll have no force. Just like that here, uh, you'll have no peak, no trough, anything. And then um, same thing here, cancels out. And, and you, if you notice at all points, it'll perfectly cancel out at all. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, all right. Um, I wanted to mention a couple of things. So constructive interference um, doesn't necessarily have to be from source. So for example, um, if you had a speaker right here at this location and then a speaker right here at this location, right? And they were creating these waves, this speaker would create this wave, this blue wave, and this speaker would create this yellow wave and assume this is exactly what it would look like, right? In this region where there's only one speaker, you would hear this, you would hear this wave only. And then once you reach this point, this wave would this wave would be created. And assuming it's like right back to back, there's no like vertical uh, distance between them, right? They're back to back. Um, they would have constructive interference. And then from this point onwards, you would have like this wave, right? So up until this point, it would be like this. And then once you reach this second speaker, it would be constructive interference. Theoretically, if you did um, this at every single location right here and added another speaker, another speaker, another speaker, and then you had a person standing right here. It, when they would hear it, they would hear something like really, really loud, like amplified many, many times over. And I um, believe that's used in some like speaker technology, right? To have constructive interference, to make things louder. Um, and, and some um, like speaker phones and stuff. Um, and I know that if destructive interference is used in noise canceling headphones, when the headphones um, receive a certain wave or a certain wave of sound, they'll create a perfectly destructive wave. They'll try and create a perfectly destructive wave to cancel out and the result will be no sound, right? And that's how noise canceling headphones work. Okay, here we go. Um, actually, before we move on Mark, to the dollar. Uh, part, before yep. you go into that, what is beat frequency then? There's questions on beat frequency. How does that play into? Uh, beat Over frequency. Uh, I'm not really sure. I would have to get uh, back to you one second. Uh, yeah, I would have to get. I would have to get back to you. I'm not exactly sure about that, and I don't want to give like a wrong answer. Okay, has nothing to do with the constructive destructive. Yeah, yeah, not, not 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 that I'm aware of. Yeah. Okay, we can move on. Um. Okay. Um. Next, we want to move on to the Doppler effect, right? So the Doppler effect states that when uh, a wave specifically a sound wave is moving towards or away from an object. If the object itself is moving, is also moving, the frequency heard by the object is different than the frequency of the sound actually emitted. Maybe a little bit confusing, but it's basically um, just states that as something is moving away from you or towards you, something that emits sound, right? Like a siren or anything like that, anything that emits sound or even a person talking, as it's moving away from or towards you, the frequency of the sound that you actually hear is different than the frequency of the sound that it is actually being released by the object, right? It's slightly altered, right? And I can show a diagram of this. So if you had like um, something that was just standing still, this is what kind of waves you would emit. This is pretend this is like frequency, right? And this is an observer, like a listener, like a human, right? This is what the frequency would sound like. If you had this exact same trumpet, except it was on um, a car that was moving towards you, the frequency would be much higher. If you had this, on a car that was moving away from you, it would be, the frequency would be much lower and it would be, and you would hear it, it's much lower. The frequency actually emitted by the by the trumpet is not changing. So it's the same, and I, that's why I don't really exactly like this picture. The, the actual frequency is the same, right? That the trumpet emits, it's, it's the same every time. What you hear is different, right? What the person hears is different. Um, and the same thing applies to, if the object is standing still, so if the trumpet was standing still, but you were moving towards the trumpet as it was making a sound, or you were moving away from the trumpet as it was making a sound, also it would um, change the frequency that you hear. But I do want to stress that the actual um, frequency emitted doesn't change, just what you hear changes. It, it's relative to the observer. Okay, next I want to move on to the actual equation for this, because this is, is like the most important part of Doppler effect will be the equation. Um, so this, so F prime is the frequency heard by the, um, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, frequency heard by the object. I, I'm 
wrote object here, but it's actually, it should be like listener or observer or something like that, right? Um, like a person or whatever, any kind of like, any that's hearing. F0, um, which is the, is the initial frequency emitted by the source is the actual frequency. And then if you wanna think of it, this whole thing, I like to think of it as like a ratio, right? So you take the original sound and then you multiply it by some ratio and then you get your altered sound, right? And this whole thing is the ratio. Um, as you can see here, it's there's these V with no subscript. This is uh, just the, sound, the speed of sound, right? Usually, again, it's 300 meters per second. They'll give it to you, right? It's the actual speed of the sound wave. Uh, this, and then you notice here it's plus minus, whereas here it's minus plus. Right, that'll come into in a bit, uh, based on direction. So sometimes you, in some textbooks and in some books, you may uh, just see uh, plus, plus, or plus, minus, or something like that, right? Just one sign on the top, one sign on the bottom. Um, whereas in others, you may see it like this. I prefer this way just because it makes it easier. Um, what that means if you only have one sign is it means you have to know when to make a velocity positive or negative, right? This V0 uh, is the um, velocity of the object, and this Vs is the velocity of the source, which is the source of the sound. Um, so you would have to know whether, if you just used one sign, you'd have to know whether to make a velocity positive or negative based on the direction it's moving away or towards you. I prefer this way because there's an easy way to remember it. Um, towards is top. So if you're moving, to, if something is moving towards, you use the top sign. For this, you use a plus because it's the top sign. Here you use minus because that's the top sign. If it's moving away, you use the bottom sign, right? In this case, minus, this case, plus, right? When I say towards and away, for example, this is talking about um, the object or the listener, right? The actual listener. The, the, if the listener is moving towards the source of the sound, you would use plus. If the listener is moving away from the sound, you use the bottom of minus. If the, and VS on the bottom here stands for source, right? If the source is moving towards the listener, you would use the top. If the source is moving away from the listener, you'd use the bottom, right? And again, you could use, um, for this one, it could be, you could be using the bottom one because it's moving away. And for this one, you could be using the top one because you're moving towards, right? And it, those are separate. Okay. Does that make sense? Um, any questions about anything we covered so far um, that you guys wanna ask? Sure. Um, yes, sir. Hi, um, could you please go back to the slide before this one? Yeah, of course. One. Or I think it was the other one. The one with the um, definition of Doppler effect? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, the reason I didn't spend too much time on this Doppler effect is the definition is a little bit hard to understand. I mm -hmm. would think like showing a picture and transform that would be help you understand, but yeah, if you, if you want this, of course, if this helps. Okay, um, any other questions? So I think, um, oh, somebody asked about echo. Um, so echo is, uh, echo is just a sound that's, um, so for example, so for example, echo, if you had a source, then a wall right here, um, and then you release a sound wave going here, all echo does is it's, somewhat similar to reflection in um, light, it just bounces off and it goes back at you, right? Um, if you mean how echo can relate to Doppler effect, um, if you are running in, um, obviously a wall can't really move, um, so the source of sound won't be moving, but if, for example, you were running um, away from a wall that was echoing your um, voice back at you, uh, Doppler effect would still apply, just just as you would expect, right? As if you, you the object, is moving away, right? And um, somebody asked here. I'll go back to the equation. Oops, sorry. Uh, 
um, I'll go back to the equa uh, equation. So if it's moving away, the sign uh, of the bottom is negative, but what about the, okay. Um, so each one's individual. For example, um, you, you could, so for example, um, if you weren't moving, so in, in the case of, in the picture, the person was standing still and then the, and the ambulance with the siren is coming at you. This, um, are you moving towards or away? You're really moving neither. The velocity of um, the object, which is your velocity is zero. So it's just V, it doesn't matter if you do plus or minus zero, it's still V, right? It doesn't matter. Whereas um, the source is moving towards you. So you use the top sign, so it's V minus uh, VS, right? If you're moving towards uh, the object, but the object is moving away from you. So for, for example, if uh, the ambulance was driving away from you and then you were running after the ambulance, right? You would be moving towards the ambulance. So you would be positive. The ambulance would be moving away from you. So it would also be positive, right? So you would use the top sign because you're moving towards the ambulance. However, the ambulance would use the bottom sign because it's moving away from you, right? And this is also possible. So it depends on each situation. And if you, if one of the objects, either the source or you are not moving, you're stationary, it doesn't matter which sign you use because this would be zero, right? Um, so somebody asked, can you relate it um, to ultrasound? Um, Ultrasound, um, if you, you mean, um, do, do you mean kind of like the, the way they use it in the medical uh, procedure, like like in that in that sense? Because, because if, if that is what you are referring to, like ultrasound, like a medical procedure, um, they use actually um, echo. Uh, ultrasound is fairly similar to echo location like bats use. Right, and it, it doesn't use the Doppler effect really. Um, mainly it uses um, just, just echolocation. It's, it's very similar to echolocation. They just release sound waves into um, a person or whatever they're imaging. And then um, when it encounters, um, say one of the main use of ultrasound is like pregnancy. So imagine this is the baby. When it re reaches the baby, it'll bounce off and it'll come back. And there's receivers back here that will, um, kind of receive it and then they'll know, notice, oh, there, there's an object there and it'll kind of like image it because it's being shot out from all sides, right? Very complicated stuff, but basically it's echolocation that bats use, very similar to that. The, the principle is the same. Yeah. Yeah, so echolocation is very commonly, can be used, right? And ultrasound is very similar to that. It doesn't really use Doppler effect. I'm sure they have um, some, uh, ways that they don't really expect um, organs or anything like that to be moving too much. But in, in the case they are, I'm sure they kind of, because um, they're not really looking at like exactly the frequency of the sound. So I don't think they're really looking at, um, so exactly at that, they're more reading that the sound waves are there and they're measuring the distance, right? Any other questions? And if not, um, Esther, do you have another question? Is that from your previous question, the hand raise? Sorry, that was from my previous question. Okay, last poll question of the day.
take another 30 seconds to a minute to answer the question. Okay, I'm gonna stop the polling. Okay, so it seems that um, most people have picked choice C, which is correct, All right? And I'm happy to see that. So two jets are flying together, one with a siren and the other with a receiver, which is a some kind of listening device. As the speed of the siren jet flying away from the receiver jet increases, what happens to the distance between adjacent peaks of the wave as heard by the receiver? First thing you have to notice is what are they actually asking for? What happens to the distance between adjacent peaks of the wave as heard by the receiver? They're asking for F prime, right? The distance between, or they're asking for a variation of, of frequency, right? So the distance between peaks, the frequency is the distance between peaks, right? But um, if, for example, the distance between peaks increases, that means the frequency is actually decreasing, right? Okay, um, so um, let's get to um, the actual equation. So it's F uh, zero, but we're not really uh, particularly interested in that. Like I mentioned, it's a ratio. So we can actually just ignore this and just do V, V plus minus, minus plus. Um, and on the top is um, object. And then here is the, um, source, right? Um, as the speed of the siren jet flying away from the receiver jet increases, so the speed of the source is increasing away. Away means the bottom, so we're using the plus sign, right? And as this speed increases, what happens to this? Well, causing, you know that this would be V either plus minus, and we don't care, plus minus VO. It actually doesn't matter, right? Whereas this is V um, plus Vs, right? As this increases, the whole, as Vs increases, the whole bottom, the denominator will increase. If the denominator increases, that means this number as a whole, right? If you wanna think about this whole thing as a number will decrease because if the denominator is getting bigger, that means the whole thing is getting smaller, right? It's like how you're going from one fifth to one sixth, one tenth, one hundredth. As the denominator is increasing, the, the whole number is actually getting smaller, right? So that means this is getting smaller. If this is getting smaller, that means um, F prime is also getting smaller because they're proportional. If F prime is getting smaller, that means the frequency is decreasing. If the frequency is decreasing, the distance between the peaks is increasing, right? Because um, the distance between peaks is what frequency measures. Low distance between the peaks, that means there's uh, a lot of peaks, is um, frequency. And uh, distance between adjacent peaks is um, very similar to wavelength, right? So it's asking, actually asking for wavelength. You know, wavelength and frequency are inversely proportional. As one increase, the other decreases. So if wavelengths increasing, if, if frequency is decreasing, wavelength is increasing, the answer is C. Hopefully that made sense. And um, uh, uh, so any questions about this? Yeah, yeah, um, the dis distance between uh, peaks is wavelength. Yeah, yeah, that, that's essentially it. So it is actually asking for something similar um, to wavelength. Um, yeah, 
So it's actually, yeah, it, it is as for wavelength. But you remember that f prime and wavelength are also very related. You can really say as frequency increases, wavelength decreases, as wavelength incre decreases, frequency increases. So yeah, yeah. They're, they're very related. You can really um, think of it either way. It just, so um, yeah, I, I, I guess I didn't make a mistake, but it was just so innate that um, as a top equation, it, it didn't really matter because if, if you look at it, um, for example, V um, plus minus, V O, right? If you knew this was getting bigger, it didn't matter if this was getting smaller or if this was also getting bigger. Um, as the bottom got bigger, it just naturally got smaller, right? It, it doesn't matter if you were plus or minus, right? Because obviously, um, V zero, you know, even if it was if it was minusing, you know, V zero is not bigger than V, right? Because it's not faster than the speed of sound. Um, usually, that's the assumption you make. Um, so V is still like a, getting a smaller positive number, even if it, and if it was top, um, it was still would not be. Um, so as as the other jet is accelerating away from you, so even if you're, so V is velocity. If you even if you're moving towards right, as the other one's accelerating, it's still growing the distance. It's still like growing, right? If if that makes sense. Um, so even if this is getting bigger, this is getting bigger more bigger i guess because this is this is it says it's um as the speed increases so it's like accelerating away all right um any other questions i actually did have an answer for your uh, beat frequency question right and that that's that's definitely beyond the scope of the mcad they don't really ask that um, I, at least I haven't seen it, but um, it does have to do with uh, interference. Um, oh, by the way, this is the last question. So thank you all for coming. Uh, reminder, office hours every Sunday at 8.30, lectures um, tomorrow and Saturday as well. Same time, if um, the PowerPoint will be posted, recording will be posted, um, please email me if you have any questions. And I'll, I'll be staying for another maybe 10 minutes to answer questions, okay? Um, but you mentioned uh, beat frequency. So beat frequency is really what happens when uh, we you do destructive um, when you do destructive interference. Um, we have destructive interference, but it's not complete destructive interference like this, right? This is complete destructive interference. Um, whereas sometimes you might not have that. You may have like. It's hard, it's hard to draw here. Let me have a picture as well, just so I can reference, but it, it looks something like this. Right, and that's when it's not perfectly destructive. So, and if you imagine the two waves are like, um, these are the two waves. Sorry, those are a little messy, but yeah. Um, so again, it's not perfectly destructive, but it's it's partially constructive, partially destructive, right? Um, and then you get a resulting um, thing of like this. This would be the resulting wave, and essentially, um, the this is what a beat frequency, right? Um, because there's different areas of constructive and destructive interference. There's um, beat frequency, and this would have, I believe. Uh, beat frequency of uh, three, I think, because it's these. But I, I let me just double check, um, make sure. Let me just uh, double check. Yeah, yeah. So it would be how many complete cycles um, there are, which in, in this case is three. So it would be frequency would be three. This is, you really don't have to. Um, Okay, you really don't have to know this, I think. But yeah, this is if you want to, like, just know, right? This, this happens when you have incomplete constructive destructive inference. So some parts have constructive, some parts have destructive, some parts have large mixed. 
Any other questions? Hey, Mark, um, how does Ralph's law play in with all this um, partial pressure that you mentioned? Can you hear me? Um, yes, one second. Let me just uh, stop the recording before we continue. 